Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome back to our Bible class, our midweek Bible class, going through the Gospel of Mark. Last time we made it through verse 29 in our Gospel of Mark. And during this Easter season, we we have been, our readings haven't been following our Bible study. And that's just, we'll get back on track later on in Pentecost. But for now, we've been going through all of the events of that first Easter day in the different in the different accounts we have in the gospel lessons. So without going too much into that, let me just say hello to Martin. Martin got to come back for the first time this past Sunday. It was a joy to see him and as it is to see and be with all of our church family in these days. And, and uh, we welcome him back. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord of life, we praise you for your word, and we pray that you strengthen us through it, that hearing it together we be edified, and that your Holy Spirit would enlighten our understanding to the glory of your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we left off last time. You remember at the end of, of our lesson last time from Mark 6, verse 29, 30, I think, we had John the Baptist in his confrontation with Herod, and he was was preaching the law, a very stout proclamation of the law, because Herod had his brother Philip's wife and had taken her as his own wife. And uh, so he condemned Herodias and, and uh, their behavior. And then, uh, of course, you remember the dancing and all that stuff that led to finally asking for them, asking for John the Baptist's head on a platter. Well, we won't go back back into that, except we'll start at verse, verse 30 in chapter 6. <clears throat> Excuse me. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. Now, I'd have to, that's very interesting to me to, to see that there they are described as the apostles. And I would have to go through and look to see how his, how his usage has been all throughout the Gospel of Mark. But after he has just sent them out, then it's very natural that they would be described as the apostles apostolos, those who are sent. So um, the disciples were followers, learners, and then when when sent out became the sent ones or the apostles. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. So they're reporting back to Christ all the wonderful things that God had done through them. And it's important to, to recognize it and say it that way. And it can be, it should be very humbling for us, whether it's as a pastor or as a parent. We know that that God, the Holy Spirit, works through his word. And that if anything, if anything good is to be accomplished through it, it's always going to be accomplished through God's work and God's word. And then in a sense, it's a miracle. It is always a miracle of God when he can somehow in his in his strength to change hardened hearts, to call them to faith. There's so many times we see even even dear Christians who love their Savior, their children drift away and uh, they stop coming to church and finally they extinguish that flame of faith. They get wrapped up in the world and just forget about Christ and how heartbreaking that is. And for me with young kids, how scary it is that uh, that this can happen to people that we know have have you know put calluses on their knees praying for their their little ones. Well, a couple things there. God can always bring them back, and He's never going to stop working to the end of days. He's never going to stop working in the heart of His baptized child. So even if somebody should wander away, God can bring them back. But when that work continues, that that bringing back occurs, it's always going to be a function of the Holy Spirit working through God's Word. And that's why it is so important for us as parents to, to never stop inviting, or grandparents to never stop encouraging and inviting so that our dear ones can be in heaven with us. And it just kind of reminds me, I should have looked this up again, but I was reading this one in my devotions, this this morning from first 
Thessalonians chapter 2. And now I'll never be able to find it, but I was thinking about those verses. And hopefully I will be able to, be able to find it here just in because it it's just stuck in my mind. Um Well, it's all very good. But in chapter 2, verse 7, Paul says, We were gentle among you like nursing mother, taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. And uh, what a what a precious ministry of love it is for us as as to encourage and to invite and to to call upon and, and help share the words of life. Um, he goes on, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. You know, that's such an important thing, and I don't do it well. I pray that God help me to do it better and that he would use it. But think of that. We exhorted you that exhortation, don't walk away, continue in what you've learned. We exhorted each one of you and encouraged you. There's a different, a little bit different connotation there, the encouragement that uh, continue to, to walk in the hope that you have, the, the good news, the encouragement we have in the gospel and charged you or urged you, I think is what it was in the NIV when I read it this morning, to walk in a manner worthy of God. So that's that's the best we can do is to encourage and exhort and urge and, and implore our dear ones to walk. But God's got to finally do it. He's the one that, that's Holy Spirit is going to work. And people, it, if somebody rejects that ministry of salvation, that doesn't mean that God is not completely serious in his desire for souls to be saved. It is possible for people to reject. However, if somebody is saved, it is not because they were smarter or because they were less resistant than the other people. If somebody is saved, it's always to God be the glory and his great work he has done. But if somebody is damned, it's their own it's their own putting up roadblocks and obstacles and and not allowing the Holy Spirit to do that work that he wants to do. God doesn't grab it, drag anyone kicking and screaming against their will into heaven. If they refuse it and reject it, they reject that word of life. But God's going to continue to call, right? Jesus looked at Jerusalem and said, how I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. God was always willing, but they were not. So we pray God give us willing hearts and help us to share the invitation. So the so that Jesus said to the apostles when they got back, he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. That's probably, sometimes I think that especially for very active members of, of churches, especially in our day and age, we need active members of churches, people who are more than just there on Sunday, and that is, is is no small thing. That is so important. Your prayers are so important, but also your labors for the kingdom. Those are wonderful. If God's given you many blessings. Then use all that you are and have here, your resources, your money, your time, your gifts, the sweat of your brow to serve him. They come back and he says, let's go away for a little while. There's also a time for rest. That's why God gave the Sabbath in the first place, correct? So that so that we could have a time set apart to be strengthened in God's word and to be refreshed in spirit. So we don't want to we don't want to become such that that people burn out because because they aren't adequately being refreshed and having time to rest and relax. Even Jesus with the disciples. He wants the disciples to come away by themselves. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. I mean, Jesus is, is the world is flocking to him, and understandably so. And they went away in a boat, in the boat, to a desolate place by themselves. 
I think that this is the desolate place that they went when they crossed the Sea of Galilee. They went away by, to a desolate place by themselves. Um, desolate, we think of, I, I think that this is just going to be uninhabited, not necessarily like the desert, because he's going to talk about green grass here in a second. So um, they, now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. No rest for the weary, as the, how the old saying goes. So they, they, the crowds cannot be frustrated in their will and their desire and intent to be with Christ and receive his blessings and benefits. And in a way, boy, it would that we were as zealous as they. That's how we should be in our prayers. And it's very convicting because I'm not. And I, I um, we have to remember that almost to, to chase God down and, and carry our prayers up to him. And, and uh, he wants to hear our prayers and loves to hear our prayers. But uh, look at these people are relentless. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now here we're following the same order that we see in, in Matthew and that we see also in in John's gospel. It's, it's, it's just a little different. Everything's a little different in John's gospel. But uh, the, the same kind of arrangement here is he goes away by, to take them on by themselves and he has compassion. And that word literally um, means a, a kind of a twisting of the guts. It's a, a, a visceral, not uh, just a not just a verbal kind of, a, oh, I feel bad for them. But this gut wrenching, twisting, he has compassion on them because they're like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus has come to be their good shepherd. God promised. Look at Ezekiel 34 and you will see that Jesus is, was promised. Not only does the Lord say, hey, I, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But in Ezekiel 34, God chastises them because their shepherds weren't good spiritual shepherds. They were careless and failed in their roles and responsibilities. So God has promised in Ezekiel 34 that he was going to send the true shepherd. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I will seek the lost and bring them back. Bring back the strayed, bind up the injured, and strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong. I will judge between sheep and sheep. This is Ezekiel 34. And uh, I will judge between the sheep and the sheep. And I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. Read that all on your own. But you see Ezekiel 34, God says, I'm going to be the shepherd now. You've been lousy at it. I'm going to take over the job. And then he says, that the Lord's going to take over the job. But then he says, I'm going to set over them one shepherd, my servant, David. Well, you know, David, of course, was a shepherd before he was a king, but he also was long dead by the time Ezekiel wrote. He's talking about the son of David, the, the one who was born in the city of David in Bethlehem. He's talking about Jesus is the one that, that is being prophesied there out of the line of David, who's going to be the true and perfect shepherd. And indeed, in John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. So Ezekiel 34 is met here as is, is a f fulfillment of Jesus says that, sees that they are sheep without a shepherd. And that is the complaint all the way through Ezekiel 34. Um, and he began to teach them many things. So even though they haven't had a chance to eat, they haven't had a chance to hardly take a breath and get away on their own, Jesus begins, excuse me, Jesus begins to teach them many things. So he's he doesn't step back even in their near exhaustion, which is intriguing anyway, because Jesus is true man. So, of course, he is hungry. He is tired. He does sleep, all of those things that are real but sinless human needs and emotions. Jesus had, because Jesus was a real man, like us in every way except without sin. Excuse me. Um, 
so, and when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Okay, there wasn't a 7-Eleven on the corner and there were no McDonald's. Can you imagine there were no, no, uh, McDonald's within walking distance? Um, it's probably the last era that that was true. I know, I'm just teasing, but um, so they're way out in the middle of, of nowhere. The hour is, it's getting very late. Send them away to go to the surrounding village, countryside and villages, and buy themselves something to eat. So the people are all coming to Jesus. Jesus and, and the disciples don't yet understand that that's a good way to be, that they should be coming to Jesus. And Jesus is going to be the one that gives them their daily bread. And you and I don't understand that too often either, is that Jesus is going to take care of us. And we need to, to be mindful and remind ourselves of that wonderful, glorious truth that even when we don't know how we're going to draw our next bite or whatever it is that you're going through, God does. And he knows how to take care of you and give you all that you need. Perhaps not all that you want, but certainly all that you need and all that he knows is best for you. And sometimes hunger is best for you and I, right? for you and me. It doesn't seem like it ought to be so, but if it causes us in hunger to cast our cares upon him, then it's been to a good end and a good purpose. You give them something to eat, Jesus said. He's testing them. You give them something to eat. He knew, knows they can't give something to eat to that many people. They said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread? You know, if a denarii is enough food for one day, so we're talking almost seven months wages for, for a, your typical worker, it would have taken. Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? The answer is is in the phrasing of their question is, this is impossible. We can't do it. What are you talking about? You give them something to eat. And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And he and when they when they had found out, they said five and two fish. We'll just leave it how they got it. You you know from John, John tells us a little bit more about how they actually where they did get the five loaves and the two fish. In John chapter six, for whatever reason, Mark is is they all pick out different parts of it that they feel worth worth putting in there. And I when I say that, I know that it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. So ultimately they write what God's given them to write. But the five loaves and the two fish in Mark's gospel, it comes out of a boy's lunch. So that uh, he had it with him. Did I say Mark? John's gospel. Then Jesus commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So it's not in the desert. This is, we ought to be thinking more in terms of a, a you know, plush place, at least a place with enough green grass to seat 5,000 people. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties. I don't know that there's anything special about the the way they're grouping off, except to make it manageable, you know, on a practical matter to make it manageable for them to try to feed the groups. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave it to the disciples to set before the people. Now it's very interesting in the in the way that is worded in the Greek is it is a very close parallel to, in fact, the I think the verbiage is almost identical there between this account and the, the Lord's Supper, where he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he, he gave it to the disciples. I think I got that the wrong way. He blessed it, he broke it, and gave it to the disciples. The same verbiage, the same uh, progression there. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe Mark is in advance kind of foreshadowing the great miracle of the Lord's Supper, where where he fed his disciples with with Christ's very own body and blood. He fed his disciples with with that heavenly food. And here he's feeding their bodies with with the the with earthly food. And I think the the other parallel here besides the to recognize the the very near language between this and the institution of the Lord's Supper is to say it also reminds us of it also reminds us of the Exodus account and how God through Moses provided manna in the desert and he 
he met the needs of his starving people there. And in a sense, you do get the impression that each of the gospel writers wants us to think of Jesus ministry to the people in his care as re, a, a redo of God's care for his people in the Old Testament, how, how he led them through in the 40 years in the wilderness, led them through the, the sea on dry ground, 40 years in the wilderness and the bread and, and manna provided for them. That so many of those things are paralleled in life of Jesus, going through the waters of baptism, 40 days in the wilderness, now, now Jesus is going to be the one that feeds, feeds his people that he has compassion on. He feeds them with the bread and the fish. So he says the blessing and the disciples set it before all the people and he divided the two fish among them all and they all ate and were satisfied. That's not to be missed either. The saddest, they were all satisfied. I mean, he didn't just give each a morsel or a little taste to tide them over. It says they all ate and were satisfied. So he pre provided an incredible amount of food for them to satisfy their bellies. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces. There's the 12 earlier. We talked about the 12, uh, the 12 years of blood, the 12 year old girl that was healed. Now it's the 12 baskets. And I mean, I don't know what to make of it beyond it's, it's, you know, there are 12 disciples. It's not surprising that each of them would take a basket and go around and pick up. And, and I don't know that we should read any more into it than that, but regardless of the, the number 12, it is to say that when God gives his gifts, he gives more than we could ever need. Okay, He doesn't just give enough or almost enough. He doesn't parcel it out and piece it out. When God gives his blessings, he gives more than we could ever need. And uh, that is, is true in the spiritual realm, that God's grace is always more. It's always more than we could ever need. Um, you know, in the earthly realm, God doesn't give us, you know, a feast for 5,000 people in one day because God wants us to live with a daily, uh, direct, with our daily lives directed toward him to pray, Lord, give me today my daily bread. God doesn't you know, if, if he if he gave me, if we all had a billion dollars in our back pocket and God gave us that blessing, he certainly could do that. But there's always the grave danger that I become so satiated that I, I don't look to him anymore. And so, you know, well, I'm, I'm fine without him. Then I drift away. That's no blessing. So in in our earthly, God gives us what we need. God gives us according to his will as he knows best how to take care of us. In his spiritual gifts, God always gives us more and abundantly. And here he gives in these earthly gifts that he bestows 12 basketfuls of broken pieces. And those who ate were 5,000 men. Now, it's hard to know how many. I mean, we think, wow, if it was just men and each one of them had a wife, whatever, it could be a bunch of people, 10,000 people, who knows? And it's possible. It's also possible it's also possible that that maybe a lot of women wouldn't be in these kinds of groups because let's face it, maybe the women were doing actually all the work. Maybe they were the ones that the men were the ones that perhaps would have had the opportunity and, and say the leisure to be able to go around uh, following Jesus and listen to him preach. But I don't know. So it could be 10,000. We don't know. What it tells us is there were 5,000 men. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. There's the immediately, immediately, immediately. It's always in Mark to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. So Jesus forces them to get into the boat and go across the lake to Bethsaida. Bethsaida is up there. Um, given what they are about to experience out on that lake, it's fair to say, why did Jesus, knowing what they were about to go through and the storm that was going to hit them and the fears that were going to, they were going to be confronted with, why did he make them do it? Why did he immediately make them 
make them get into the boat. And I think that may he made his disciples. Don't underestimate that because sometimes God makes us sometimes God makes us to lie down in green pastures and by the still waters. And that's wonderful whenever it's all peaceful and good. And sometimes God makes us go through the valley of the shadow of death in either respect in the good times, in the bad, in the easy times or the hard. He's with us and he's going to be with the disciples, even though he's making them go through a terrible storm. That terrible storm is going to teach them to cast all their cares on him. And it's going to teach them, like the feeding of the 5,000, when they're bone tired, he's going to teach them in the feeding of the 5,000, he can meet their needs. And, and once again, he's teaching us, he can meet your needs. Right? He forces them, makes them go into the boat uh, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of the crowd, Jesus went up on the mountain to pray. God wants you to set aside that time that time for prayer. He wants you and, and me to be the like the crowds that relentlessly come to Christ. We'll always bang on his door. Continue to come and, and bring your prayers to him. And uh, Lord, teach us to pray. You know, the disciples asked Jesus that, and we should ask that too. God, help me pray. Teach me to pray. Because he's got wonderful blessings to pour out on us, and we just we trust that and we know that that is God's truth. But um, too often we, we are derailed from, from claiming that. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea and he was alone on the land. And Jesus saw that they were making headway painfully. Let me see. When evening came, the boat was out on the sea and he was alone on the land. So Jesus is up on the mountainside praying. It's, it's a uh, once again, it goes to show that that not leisure, but time apart to be fed and to be strengthened and to pray, to commune with God in that gift of prayer is a blessed thing and is an important thing. And Jesus exemplifies that in a law, a law sense. In other words, he's an example for us. We should do this in the sense of the law. Pray. God commands it. Pray without ceasing. That is law. But the gospel side of it is, look at Jesus is the, the one who does it perfectly. And he does it in your place because you and I don't. And that is the gospel. He's the only one that gets the second commandment correct. He's calling upon God in prayer, praise, and give thanks. And um, so he's thanks be to God that Jesus does perfectly what you and I do not. And he saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. Well, it's dark, okay? It's the middle of the night, and he sees them making making a headway painfully. I'd say that is a pretty clear indication that Jesus is God because he doesn't need he doesn't need night vision goggles. He doesn't need to somehow have an illuminated spotlight pointing out across the Sea of Galilee. He sees them in their struggle against the against the wind for the wind was against them in about the fourth watch of the night so fourth watch of the night if if it's broken up in in little segments would be like three four something like that three to six in the morning the six in the morning would be the beginning of the new day so the fourth watch of the nights the, the the very last one so they've been fighting the wind all night he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. I love that. I don't under, I, I, I just let it speak for itself. He meant to pass by them. It would seem to be, okay, so he was just planning on walking by. Is that what's going on there? Or he's pretending like he's just passing by or uh, you know, what is what is the intention there that when it says he meant to pass by them? But anyway, it doesn't happen because when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out for they all saw him and were terrified. Right. They see they see somebody walking on the water and they think it's a ghost, not because he didn't walk on the water with his body. He did walk on the water with his body. But because in their way of thinking, a human body does not walk on water. And that is how we think also is a human body does not 
think of the all of these Easter accounts we've just read. The, the doors are locked. Jesus comes and stands in the midst of them. After he, he breaks bread with the Emmaus disciples, they're sitting there and he disappears. How does his body do this? It doesn't need to be let in the door. He doesn't climb in a window. He appears and disappears. He His body is clearly a human body. That's how he proved the resurrection. He said, put your finger here. He took bread and, and a fish and ate it so that they could see him eat it. He Because they kept thinking, well, it can't be. It's got to be a ghost. It's got to be a spirit because a human body can't do that. But Jesus' body could do that. And he proved it was it was he by making them, exactly making them put their fingers in his hand and see that it was Jesus. So their reaction is he's a ghost. And I think this is, is relevant to the Lord's Supper. At least you think of the Lord's Supper and um, and people say, well, how could Jesus give us his body and blood in the Lord's Supper? And the answer is, because Jesus is true God and true man, he can do with his real human body whatever he chooses. And it is his will in his mercy to give to me his body and blood to eat and to drink. Now, faith's reaction to that can't be, well, God can't do that. That's impossible. Or why would he want to do that? It's to let God be God. And that's what the church has always done with respect to the Lord's Supper, is to say, it's not my job to teach him what he can't do with his body, but to believe what he says. Jesus' body, his real body, walks on water. The disciples think it's a ghost. It's not. It's, it's, a, it's a truly, it, it's Jesus there walking across the water. For they all saw him and they were terrified. I get that. You know, storm, it's bad enough, but somebody uh, they think's a ghost walking across the water. Immediately he spoke to them, again, immediately. He spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I. This is one of those great ego and me statements where, where Jesus says, ego and me. The English translators translate, it is I which I would be, I, I would not suggest is wrong, but it's interesting that whenever whenever Moses asked the Lord who was he was supposed to tell Pharaoh who sent him, God said, it is, he said, I am. Tell him, I am sent you. That was the divine name from the Old Testament, Yahweh, I am. And there's all of these spots in in John's gospel, especially in in Mark's gospel, in each of the gospels where Jesus says, "Take heart, I am." Maybe he's saying more there than it is I. Maybe he's literally saying, "I'm God." It's it's not a ghost. I am. That's the same one who who spoke to Moses through the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. I am. Do not be afraid. In John's gospel, I think you could make a very strong case. Seven times there are I am statements in John's gospel, and seven times they are followed by a predicate, um, like a I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the door. I am, oh, come on. You got to help me. Um, I am the vine. And there's one more. There's seven times in John's gospel where we miss one there, uh, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am the, I am, and then he follows it. And then there's just seven statements where Jesus says, ego and me, or I am. And seven's a very prominent number there. It's a completion. I think John's trying to tell us Jesus is God. Hmm. Go, go figure. Well, that's Jesus says here in verse 50, take heart, I am. Do not be afraid.
why why do we have to be afraid it's not a ghost it's it's god he's got, he loves us and has us in his hands and that's true for you too he loves you and has you in his hands if you fear the virus if you fear first of all join the crowd there's the, there are all kinds of fears in life and frustrations and worries and they afflict us all for ourselves for our dear ones but don't fear the one who can only destroy the the body but fear the one rather who can destroy body and soul in hell, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10. And I think that's a great comfort. It sounds very ominous and scary and a, a harsh word of law, but it's not really. Jesus is saying, you don't have to be afraid of somebody, even a, a virus that can only take your earthly life. Fear the one who can destroy body and soul in hell. And you know that's where our true... That's why Luther said we, in the first commandment, we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. If the big, if the thing you fear most in life is the virus or running out of money or, I don't know, take your pick. If, if those are the things you fear most in life, they are your God. Right? So Jesus says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. If if your God is the true God, then you can you can rest in Him. Let your fears rest in Him, and by that we mean uh, what Proverbs would say: "In in the fear of the Lord is to hate evil." Right. That's that that's what we mean when a reverence for God and to, a hatred of evil and sin. And Jesus got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. Okay, there's, there is a, you know, the, they're making painful headway in Mark's gospel. I, it seems less dire, or he makes a less of a big deal out of, of the jeopardy that they are in, I think, if you compare it to the others, the other accounts. But that part's there, too. He gets into the boat, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Um you know, that isn't to say that God hardened their hearts uh, necessarily, although that could happen too uh, until the appropriate time. God certainly hardened the heart of Pharaoh, but you'll note five times Pharaoh hardened his heart before God said, oh, you had your chance. And then, then from then on, it was the Lord hardened his heart. My guess is here that whenever it talks about their hearts were hardened, uh, that it wasn't that God was hardening their hearts. They were hardening their hearts. Their hearts were being hardened by themselves through their unbelief. We don't want to do that. You know, don't let, whether it's for you, do not let your posture toward God ever be pushing him away and holding him off at a distance as though, okay, there's a, there'll be a better time in my life. I'll be more ready to have uh, to walk with him and be his child. Don't ever hold him at a distance because you don't know when that day of grace passes. But rather, today is now is the acceptable time. Second Corinthians four, six, something like that. Second Corinthians says it's also it's Psalm ninety five. Today is the day of salvation. So don't put it off. Uh, their hearts were hardened. They are in their hearts. Well, God's going to break down that hard heart. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him. Again, immediately. There's no, Jesus cannot get away. You you get the impression how exhausting. It's, it'd almost be like going to the cross and hanging on the cross was the first six hours of rest he had in three and a half years. But the people immediately recognized Jesus and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. Not because there's anything... Uh, divine about his garment and or or anything supernatural about his garment it's the the being made well is a function of they've come into contact with the one who wills to heal and help 
right? So as many as they even laying laying their sick in the marketplace, they're begging him that that he should let people touch his the fringe of his garment. Remember, that's what happened with the lady a couple chapters ago that, that was sick for 12 years with a flow of blood. She touched the fringe of his garment and she was made well. And then Jesus said, oh, who touched me and all that good stuff. But God's miraculous power at work and his His love for his people. I think we'll close there. Matthew 7, we'll, we'll pick up next week and we'll say a few words about baptism in, in Mark chapter 7. I apologize. And um, we'll let it go for there or for now. Um, I hope I... Well, we'll just we'll, we'll let it go for, for now and then pick up the the pieces again next week. So if you have any questions, of course, always type in. Nobody ever does, but if you do, I mean, I don't know, I might be talking to myself, but if you do have questions, always, or, or things that, that are important that need to be shared and you pick up on in your own research, then you're very welcome to do that too. Lord, we thank you that you sent your son to provide for us uh, eternal salvation by his resurrection from the dead. But we thank you also that you care to feed us in, in our bodies, that as you fed the 5,000, so you, you provide for us each day our daily bread. Give to us all that we need. Help us to seek every good thing from you. Help us never to be uh, so uh, content with ourselves that we, and bloated with our own, with our own, whatever it is that we ever turn away from you, but always that we always look and hunger and thirst for the righteousness that you would have provided in the blood of your Son. In his name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.